Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started, and then hopefully we will trickle in. All right, so the last time we started off talking about market research, and we covered these topics, right? The first was if we're going to do something, granted we're in a sandbox, but when we're not in a sandbox, right, if we're going to do something, we're taking on a big risk, and we talked about some different ways in which we could mitigate that risk. Right? So what were some suggestions for how you can mitigate personal risk when you're doing something new? Um, work in an area that you already kind of know. Okay. Work in an area you already know. What else? Doing your market research. Okay. Doing your research. Positioning. Uh, not so much on the risk <laughs> side, but yeah, that is important. Okay. <laughs> well, we talked about... Now, we talked about having market awareness, right? So you need to know the past, present, and the future. All right. And then we talked about positioning. So I, I know that you all know what positioning is at this point, but we'll go into a little bit more about positioning. And then we talked about competitive analysis, and the reason that we need to do it is so that we understand, have a deep understanding of our competitors, right? It's not enough to just pretend like we know who they are and what they're doing, but really get a deep insight into who we need to be concerned about and those that have the most market share. Then we talked a little bit about some various differentiation techniques and then ended with the fact that the whole goal of doing all of this, right, is so that we can identify who our early adopters are. All right, so once again, lab two is up. So if any of you have questions, either post to the listserv or ask me now or email, and like I said, get started early. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention last time is some of you I know are seniors and may want to go work for a startup after this. If you haven't already taken the time to explore into downtown Durham, um, there is a place called the American Underground, and they are incubating about 10 different startups. They actually have two locations. Um, but a couple of them reached out to me and said, hey, would any of your students be interested in working for us? So if you are interested, let me know. I'm happy to make introductions. Right. And then, of course, the usual reminder of your idea summary. Uh, I am going to be having some office hours probably in the middle of October at the Do Hack. <coughs> If you know other people not in this class who want my help, that's fine too. Um, but just let them know that it's coming up. I'm going to coordinate with the DHATCH coordinator, a director, to do that, and probably how we react to as well. Okay, so today we've got quite a bit to cover. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about positioning, as if we didn't talk about enough of it. And we're going to dig into the competitor even more. And then we're going to talk about this difference between a horizontal versus vertical market and why you might want to choose one or the other. And then we'll talk a little bit more about substitutes. I know I got into their substitutes exist, but we're going to talk a little bit more about how this can sometimes impact whether early adopters choose to use your product or not. And then um, the last three things will cover our secondary markets and whether or not you should build a point tool versus an integrated solution. And then the final is we'll start to transition from all this market research stuff into the next phase, which is customer discovery. All right, so before I get into that, does anybody have any questions and comments? Okay, we're all good. Okay. How are the lectures online? Where are they? I tried to find those. And okay, I'll point them out at the end. Um, they are on the Safe Engineer Duke ECE 490 website. Um, I haven't gotten the time to put all of them up yet, but I think a handful of them are there. It'll say, like, watch lecture, and you can watch it um, okay. next to the link for the slides. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so there's still no building yet. And, you know, I keep saying you have to know your competitor. And I'm not saying, you know, you need to know your competitor because you need to know them and you need to obsess about them and you need to, you know, basically monitor every step and try to do the same thing, right? That's not the point here. The point is you know enough and then you get started and you can put some blinders on, but you need, you need to know enough because a lot of times you will have conversations with early adopters where they will ask you about your competitor. So you at least need to understand why they may be interested in them, right? But of course, when you, start, when you do start building, you're going to keep your own focus. You know, you're, you're going to go a different direction than your competitor. <coughs> So, we're going to dig in a little bit deeper today, 
And the first thing I want to talk about is we talked a little bit about product line last time. I showed you that MECO chart. But the things that you need to keep in mind when we're talking about product lines are what are all the various product lines that they offer, right? Because a lot of times they might have something on the low end that appeals to one type of customer, but then they might have something on the high end, right? So if they've got a line of products, it makes it a little bit harder for you to find holes in potential customer segments to go after, right? So think about, do they have the entire spectrum? Do they you know, have a loss leader product? Do they have a mid-range? Do they have a high end? Are they covering all the bases and not leaving a lot of room for you? Or is there something else you can do? The other thing that you have to think about is um, a lot of times they might have this all-in-one product, right? Where they've got a product that actually appeals to a very large segment. Kind of like we talked about you know, an iPod, right? It appeals to a lot of different people. So in that case, it makes it pretty difficult to offer something as a luxury product or a low-end product when it's clearly, you know, owning the category itself, right? Once again, it makes it hard. Now, if instead they do have a line of products based off of different price points or based off of different user segments, then you want to see if they have some process in place for upselling. Because if they don't, then it makes it actually really easy for you because you know, they're not doing a very good job of keeping their customers in the life cycle of their sales. Okay? Well, what's upselling? Is that moving customers from one... Yeah, it's like another? if you go buy a Honda Civic today and then you come back you know, a year or two later, the guy's like, all right, why don't you trade that in for an Acura? Right? They're trying to upsell you on a better car. They're like, trade it in for our new sports car or our SUV. Right? They're always trying to get you to buy the, the bigger mm -hmm. item or the, the bigger ticket item. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing when we talk about competitors is you've really got to think about what areas they are particularly strong in. And if they are strong in it, are they going to continue heading in that direction? Right? Are they going to continue to you know, go in a certain product category, or are they going to try something new? Right? And do they have the know-how to even try something new? Sometimes people don't. Sometimes people don't have enough knowledge. Right? And if they're weak, just because they're weak, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be defeated, right? A lot of times they still have enough resources. They could go out and acquire another company. Um, but the key thing is, that are they going to think about moving in the direction that you're interested in? So just to give you a little bit more of a concrete example, right? When we look here, you know, our biggest competitor at Mint was Quicken. And the thing about Quicken is it was selling its software, lovely shrink wrap boxes, you know, at Best Buy and Office Depot and all these places, right? And when they did that, they did, they made kind of two fundamental mistakes. So the first mistake they made was they decided that they didn't want to offer their Quicken version anymore to Mac users. They really just wanted to just focus on PC users. So that was the first. And then the second mistake they made was they didn't realize people were moving away from going to Best Buy and buying TrueGraph software. And instead, people were purchasing things online, right? So now when we think back to positioning and we think about packaging, this was another mistake they made. And then, of course, the final was, you know, obviously this product wasn't easy to use, right? So it kind of encapsulates all the various parts of positioning that, you know, they failed to do. And as a result, they weren't able to make the same kind of strides that we were at Mint. Now... Um, actually, one more, one more point is even after you know, we launched, they tried to offer a competing product called Quicken Online. <coughs> but, and they, and they priced their product, <coughs> where ours was free at the time. <coughs> However, because ease of use was so bad, they didn't get the traction that we have. So even when they tried to do their strategy, the same strategy that we did, even though they had more resources, they didn't nail the third component. So this is something to keep in mind. You know, people might have a product, um, and they might have a lot of resources, but if you are the leader in that direction, then you're going to obviously do a better job, and they're just going to be copying you as a result. So, the other example, very similar, is Microsoft Money. Clearly, they neglected Mac users, right? <laughs> and uh, what they did, once again, get was packaging. Um, they also, once again, didn't get that the place, you know, everyone was moving away from shrink wrap software, and they didn't get ease of use. They had all these, you know, ridiculous features in there. 
And then what ultimately happened to them was they ended up sunsetting, which means they killed this product off in 2009. So, you know, once again, they weren't able to compete. They didn't have a very good strategy of how they were going to continue, you know, to, to change and to innovate. And instead, they just kept thinking, let's keep selling boxes of straight graph software. So, the major takeaways from this, right, when I said one of the key things to mitigate risk is to understand or to be aware of the market, right? One of the things that they failed to look at both Microsoft Money as well as Intuit Quicken was that packaging, right? The way that people were buying things were starting to change. They weren't going and buying straight drop software anymore. They were buying things online or using products online. The second was that design was also becoming important, right? Ease of use. And then the final was that, you know, people were adopting things um, based off of a number of other factors. They were looking, searching for things on web. They were looking for a mobile component. And none of these companies had this, right? So as a result, they really started to neglect a lot of their existing users as well as other users, which, of course, we were able to capitalize on. Okay? Does this example make sense? So, coming back to this definition, then, of positioning, right? We mentioned that it's about creating an image in the minds of potential customers. And that image is then going to create an identity, and they're going to then use that to figure out, you know, how are you compared to your competitor. So, the one thing about positioning, though, is, you know, we talked about repositioning. And I don't want you to think that repositioning just means that you change the price of a product and therefore you're, you've got a new position. It's actually, there are more nuances it, to that uh, than just that. I'm going to get into those. So how, how many of you are familiar with these two motorbikes? Who knows what the one on top is? Okay, I'm like not a recce class. All right, so the top one on the top is a Harley Davidson, right? I'm sure if you think Harley, you have a certain association with it, right? What's the association with the Harley? The sound, okay. <laughs> like, who do we think a biker, like a Harley? Harley like huh? The culture, like the biker dudes. Yeah, right. Like, yeah, they're they're like tough guys. They hang out at biker bars. You know, whatever. They're not afraid to get bugs in their teeth, right? <laughs> and then there's Honda's um, Cub. Okay, this was a this was a Cub Sport bike that Honda put out. So clearly, you know, Honda tried to put this thing out, and it was competing in a biker market that already had a position, right? The, the image in the minds of consumers was that, well, a motorcycle is something that, like, rough guys ride, right? And they wear leather jackets. So for Honda, you know, they couldn't just say, well, let's just offer a lesser priced product, right? Because uh, Harley Davidson had a very lengthy product line, right? It had stuff on the low end and on the high end, right? So remember I said it doesn't matter what the spectrum is, and sometimes people will have a lot of different product lines. So what do you think Honda did? Reinvented the market. Like, made another market or something. Okay. <laughs> How do you think it did that? Well, by marketing it to the other end of the spectrum of people, so not the tough guy image, but okay. to maybe the girls, I don't know, or to guys who were less... Look ahead less, of the slides. Less, no, no. Okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> okay, well, you're right. <laughs> So basically, Honda did launch a new campaign, and you know they clearly put both a girl and a guy. Um, but their tagline became "You meet the nicest people on a Honda," right? So clearly, they had to get over the stereotype of like these mean, rough guys riding bikes, and instead they wanted to do an exact, you know, 180. And for them, that kind of campaign was, you know, let's let's say you meet really nice people, and clearly the bike also reflects that. Right? It's, it's kind of a cute bike, you know, you sit saddle seat, and all that stuff, the coloring as well. So, this is what's referred to as lifestyle marketing. And the Honda actually was kind of the precursor or the pioneer in this lifestyle marketing of products. So, if you want the exact definition, um, lifestyle marketing basically means that a brand attempts to embody certain values and aspirations of a group or a culture. And that's how it promotes its products. Does that make sense? So, when you have a product line that's very similar, you can't just base it off of you know, changing the price point. You've got to think a little bit differently. Uh, and sometimes you have to think about values and aspirations rather than, you know, let's just knock $50 off of the thing, right? 
is for lifestyle marketing, isn't that like what any company really tries to do in terms of like <coughs> the product? Because like if like a car, like if you like if you have an ad and you show like a like a sports car and a guy and then like sure. a girl or something, you're promoting all the yes. lifestyle. Yes, that's true. You're absolutely right. So yes, that's but, uh, sorry. So this was back in like the 1970s, 1960s. So this was like a really cool thing back then. Yeah, today it's just like we're, we totally get it, right? We see through it. Um, but I just want to bring it up. Now, um, the other thing uh, about this is, you know, a lot of times people don't know what groups have certain values. So that's the other reason I bring it up, um, is that it's not enough to just say this is like by this for women. It's like, well, okay, but is there something more than that? Yeah, I know this is right. Okay. So, you know, once again, another product, right? Lifestyle, non technology. But the reason I bring it up is because, you know, what these guys actually did, aside from make my calves hurt, is <laughs> that they made this whole new sort of revolution in terms of an activity that people have been doing forever, right? Everybody's been running forever. And they've been a problem running barefoot, right? But they decided, you know, let's not just sell a product, let's sell an entire lifestyle, right? Because otherwise, we're not going to be able to beat out Nike, you know, who makes the running shoe. So let's instead convince people that, you know, we need to use barefoot running and come up with an entire form of running and then support that, right? Um, now, I'm kind of assuming the idea of whether they came out first or barefoot running came out first, I'm not sure, but my assumption is they probably, you know, only furthered the movement. Um, so the key thing, though, in bringing up vibrance is that, you know, early adopters are ones who embrace change, right? I know I've mentioned this multiple times, just kind of want to drive this point home, is that they're willing to, like, take off their shoes and, and run or, you know, run in vibrance. So that gives you an indication of the kind of person that you're looking for. And that they're open to a new way of life. So life in which your cows are with <laughs> For the like the first couple of weeks. So, um, the other type of, you know, way in which you can position yourself is to think whether or not you want to go horizontal or vertical. And when we think about this, horizontal means that you're basically putting a product out that's going to solve a really big problem. So it's got a very common use case. And it can apply to anybody. So, you know, large base of customers. And the thing, though, is for people to do this kind of horizontal strategy, you really have to have a lot of marketing dollars, right? Because you're going to be marketing to a lot of people. You're going to be able to put up billboards and TV ads and all that stuff. And then in the hopes that they understand what the value proposition is and what the problem is that they're trying to solve. Now, it could also either, you know, create a single product and have some upselling opportunities. That doesn't really matter when you're a horizontal product. But the main drawback to going horizontal is oftentimes you neglect very, very specific problems of a subgroup. Okay? So, like, you know, Nike offers all of these shoes, you know, all these running shoes, but they've obviously neglected a very specific subgroup, which are the barefoot runners, right? So that's something to think about you know, when you think about a horizontal market. Now, contrast, yeah. Are we only talking about B2C here? Because it seems like B2B would, wouldn't necessarily be as fragmented or... Not necessarily sure. What do you mean so. so you're saying, are you asking the question that in a you can only use horizontal in a B2B strategy? No, no, in a I'm saying, are you only you're referring to B2C? <coughs> Because what I'm seeing is, um, I mean, in a horizontal market, if you're doing B2B, mm -hmm. uh, it, the customers aren't necessary. There's not necessarily a large base of customers. It could be to be. You have Sometimes, time, right? Like credit card machines. Everyone, everyone needs one. Everyone needs a line of credit. Mm -hmm. I guess. Right? Everyone needs some accounting software. Right? There are still, there, my point is, there are still companies that try, whether or not they're doing it successfully is a different story, but there are still companies that try to do this horizontal strategy, both when they're selling directly to a business as well as to a consumer. Okay. And the truth is, you can, you can do the horizontal strategy, but the key is, like I said, you've got to have 
a very specific problem that applies to you know, a large portion of people. So you're just defining what a horizontal market is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You know, as opposed to a vertical market, which is, you know, you're just going to have one particular type of market that you're going after. Right? Like, you're just going after barefoot runners. That's a niche particular market. It's a vertical market. Right? And then within that, you can do a deep dive. You can do kid barefoot runners and, you know, guys and girls and whomever, right? So it's still a deep dive, but it's a vertical market. Okay? And the reason that you would do something like this is because now you can appeal to a very specific group and, you know, you've got a very specialized use case for what you're doing. So the key thing, you know, there's a couple key things that happen here, but the one is that if you take this kind of strategy, your product actually can't be commoditized. Who knows what commodity product means? Generics essentially, like you can't, you, you don't end up having things that everyone makes, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, when you, when, when you have a commodity, it, it doesn't, it's, it's swappable, right? Yeah. Like pork bellies are a commodity. You can, this is really a matter of, you know, where it came from, right. you're just like selling it on the stock market, right? Gold is a commodity. Like the same thing, I don't care, you know, where I'm getting it from, gold from India doesn't make a difference as opposed to Africa. It's all the same thing, so it's a commodity. Whereas if you build a product with a very specific value proposition, it's very hard, or a special use case, then it's very hard to commoditize. You can't just easily swap it in and out, right? It appeals to a certain group. It has a very... Yeah, it's not just a shoe. Exactly, right. It's not just a shoe, it's, you know, a Jimmy Choo, right? Sure. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of the key in making it, going, going after a vertical market, is you can build not only this loyal base, you can avoid this commodity. Your product retains value for a longer period of time. Doesn't mean that people can't come in and copy that, right? Clearly they can do the same thing, but it's going to be really hard because a lot of what happens in a vertical market is you develop a loyal following. So, in looking at the benefits of a vertical market, right, first, there's a clear value proposition because you're really only going after a certain group of people with a very specific use case. So, like I said before, you're able to build a loyal following. <coughs> now, you know, the product can be specialized, and like I said, it's going to be hard to replicate it. The other is that you can also not necessarily build a product in terms of, you know, it's the final version of it, but it can be involved in some sort of subsystem, right? So you might, be, if, you know, since bringing this back to ECE, you can build something that, you know, fits into a larger scheme of things. Now, the other benefit is if you do this well, <coughs> you're most likely going to find other verticals that offer or operate the same as the one you started with. So you can reskin your product for another vertical, right? So maybe you start with like barefoot runners who are women and make whatever colors women want, and then make colors the men want, it's their children, etc. So you can do more verticals after that. So. Uh, who knows this company, Aero Environment? Okay, it's a pretty cool company. So they um, basically do two things. They have this technology uh, that handles unmanned aircraft, and they also build um, products like charging systems for electric vehicles. So these are kind of two different technologies, but they think it's cool, and the founder many, many years ago, this is what he was passionate about. So if you look at a product like this, right, you think, wow, that's a really niche market. Like, see, they're just selling to, you know, people that make electric cars, or they're just selling to unmanned vehicles, whatever those are, or aircrafts, right? So how could they even, you know, do anything with that? Well, like I said before, even though they appear to be in a niche market, their product is actually used as a subsystem for larger and more mainstream products. And, and horizontal, you know, product in horizontal markets. The other cool thing is that because they've become basically the pioneer, uh, and I think like they own so much market share in this market and they do what they do so well, is that as the market has gone more mainstream in terms of electric vehicles, uh, their systems are the ones, or their products are the one that's being used to power all of this, right? So there is some value, but of course, you know, you gotta take a gamble and assume that this technology is eventually going to be adopted, right? If people didn't make electric cars then, or vehicles, then clearly this would be a useful technology. So that's sort of a risk involved when you use this strategy. How old is this company? It was, uh, started in 1971. 
The founder died in 2005. Uh, it took, it's taken them quite a while for their technology to get adopted. So he died before, like, the whole thing blew up by electric car? No, it was quite, it was quite prominent before oh. he died. Um, like, he, I think they, they, they built a couple really cool unmanned aircraft prototypes. But, yeah, it's not mainstream. But what did they do for, like, 30 years? Was it mostly the defense contracts and things, or...? The number of pivots. When we get into service to talk about, they started off as a consulting company, <laughs> and <laughs> and then they started to like build. Uh, so the story is very very intricate. Um, the founder had some like wrote some bad loan or signed some like loan check and it bounced and was in a lot of debt. And then basically built an interesting aircraft for some competition, and then got really involved in that space after it. And that's sort of where the company direction headed after that. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a, you know, one of those stories of uh, technology evolving over a long period of time. Um, but in a lot of cases, you know, in physical technology, it is going to take 10, 20 years for like the gestation cycle <laughs> before you see it in mainstream, right? Like, to, you know, today we see electric cars across a few common manufacturers um, but things like Tesla, right, it's going to be probably another <coughs> few years before they offer something that's affordable for everyone. And before, they can also allow people to drive longer distances. They don't need to have charging stations and all of that. Right? Although we've got one of the Brian. I know. Okay, so the next thing we're talking about is substitutes, right? Because like, you don't want to discount these guys. They can actually be really powerful in terms of preventing you from getting market share. So, when you think about substitutes, you have to ask the question, you know, are they part of the market that you're trying to go after, right? Is your target market, remember we had those concentric circles last time, and the target market was in the middle, so are, are the early adopters using these substitute products? And if so, you know, how much of that target market is using substitutes? Because if it's a lot, now you've got a slightly different set of hurdles, right? Which is to convince people to move away from their substitutes. The other is, you know, are they using the substitutes and are those reflecting a particular type of behavior? Like, are they using Excel because they think it's easy or because it's cheap or, you know, whatever it is, if that's a particular substitute. Like in the case of Mint, for a lot of people it was. And then the question is asked is can you transition, or right, or how are you going to transition them away from using these substitutes into using your product? And that's going to actually take a little bit of positioning as well, right? Positioning, depositioning that substitute product um, and showing that yours is better. Okay. So secondary markets are next. And who knows what a secondary market is? Okay. Um, used items uh, or yeah, things that have been sold once are being resold. Right. Resale market. Yep. So the unfortunate thing about having a secondary market oftentimes is that competitors also like to own the secondary market. And if they're building a good product that's going to last for a while, it once again puts your product in a precarious position, right? So for example, Apple you know, has this authorized reseller which means you could go and buy a refurbished um, MacBook Pro for a lesser price, so now it's, it's cheaper, and it's still going to be high quality, it's just not going to be whatever that thicker price was. And the problem now, once again, is you can't base it off of price, right? You can't offer a cheaper product if they're also owning the retailer market. So you have to think about, you know, do they, do they have something like that? Just a quick question. I know when we were defining it, we were saying that it's typically used products, but couldn't it also be for new products? Doesn't, like, secondary markets don't necessarily have to be used in the sense that like those Apple authorized resellers also are authorized to resell You're right. New products. new products as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's true. I was just wondering if that was like it or if this was like different. Yeah, in, in this case I'm yes, I'm saying it's it's a used product, but you're right. They can also I mean, like the guys that, you know, open their trunks and they're like, <laughs> we're a secondary market, right? This is all brand new stuff, but we're a secondary market. So yeah, you're right. It can be a, a second a second retailer. Got it. Okay. Yep. Um, but yeah, the the point 
the point I'm trying to make is you have to be careful because if they own this too, then they're just going to try to capture more value by selling it, you know, again. Uh, and then the other is, are they integrated into a larger system? So do they have vendor relationships, right, with people? Um, in which case, a lot of times these vendor relationships are really tight. Like they go back many, many years, they get kickbacks and discounts and all these things. And it makes it really hard for someone who's building a new technology to get in there, right? So the key thing you have to do is similar to appealing to your early adopters who may be consumers, is when you're dealing with vendors, is figure out, you know, are they happy with the products that are being sold? And it's kind of that same conversation you're going to have again that you did with consumer type uh, early adopters. Now, in many cases, if you do something that's B2B with, with vendors, is that some people are open to trying out new products, right? They might say, well, we've already got a supplier, and then, you know, your, your sales pitch has to be, okay, but would you be open to piloting something new that could be more cost effective for you, right? Or a better technology, or it's going to help you ship, or, you know, tape out your chip a lot faster, right? There's a lot of different ways in which you can offer value. Or, you know, are you stuck because they have some sort of contract or exclusive clause? In which case, you've got to try to find a, you know, competitor to your competitor and their vendor to go after or something like that. So, so the thing to think about also is, you know, it's not just enough that we talk about products here. Because a lot of times adoption isn't just about the product or how good the product is. You know, a lot of times it's true. But many times it comes down to pricing and distribution. So, for example, when we talk about pricing, you know, is the product that they're selling something that people just buy on a one-time basis, right? In which case, that's actually really beneficial because then, once the product expires or whatever, you know, you can get in there and sell a brand new product. As opposed to, they're on a contract and then you've got to figure out when someone's contract is going to expire, which becomes really difficult, right? This is the case of cell phones. Or they're going to try to upgrade. So you have to be careful about, you know, are the products that are being sold have some sort of lock-in? And a lot of times, there's going to be lock-in if there's a service associated with that product. Not always the case, but the majority of the times, in at least technology, you know, the case is if there's some sort of service. <coughs> And then, um, this, Walter brought this up actually last time, but I thought I'd just highlight it once again, is, you know, is there a competition in product placement, right? So if you go to a distributor, like if you went to Best Buy, would they say, we're not going to sell your product, like we've already got five other, you know, cell phones on the market here and, or on the display here, so, you know, what's so great about yours and not enough people are going to know about it, in which case we're not going to make any money off of it, right? So then you have to start thinking about how do you incentivize your distributors as well. And now it's no longer a pure, you know, product issue. So the problem becomes that your product is unknown, there's a heavy risk involved with it, in which case you have to figure out, again, a different distribution scheme. You can't use the one that your competitors have been using. So what do I mean by point tool versus integrated solution? We went over an example of this in the last class. <coughs> okay. Take a stab. Sure. Point two is uh, fulfilling a particular need, whereas with integrated solution, you're trying to sort of redefine the or reinvent the wheel a little bit and make make a more vast solution, I guess, which incorporates other parts okay, that come enough. before and after. Yeah. So the example I gave last time was like the flip cam versus the iPhone. They both have cameras, but one is clearly a camera, and the other one has, you know, multiple other functions. So the reason I bring up this example is a lot of times, you know, people will start off saying, well, we can't build a full solution. We've got to build something to get started, right? We're the smaller company, we have less resources, and we're trying to get just, you know, the product out the door. So you'll start perhaps building a point tool. So the problem, though, that happens is if you build a point tool is oftentimes, you know, you've got your competitor that might be a comprehensive solution, right? And if they're a comprehensive solution, then you have a couple options. 
you can actually go and build the thing that they haven't built, which their customers might be pissed about, right, so that hate category. So then you can say, hey, I built the thing that you need, and you can go partner with them. But if any of you, I don't know how many of you remember, this was back in 2007, 2008, um, when Facebook came out with the apps. Does anybody remember this? Does anybody remember what happened? <laughs> well, that's fair enough, but there was something that very specifically happened, you know, so what happened was everybody was like, oh, sure, we'll just build our app, you know, within the Facebook ecosystem, right, because we'll get distribution immediately. Because there's clearly hundreds of millions of people on this platform, right, so I'm going to go build on there. And then what happens? Facebook kind of limited the amount you could, like, advertise or you'd be on the news feed or... Right. Trying to control how much games post and... Exactly. Else. They basically, because they were your distribution source, they could basically choke off distribution anytime they wanted. So what ended up happening was Facebook issued some sort of, you know, um, statement saying that the data here isn't belong to the, com the people that built the app, it's all of Facebook's data because it's Facebook users. And so the problem with doing something like this where you build your app or your product or whatever and it fits into a competitor is a lot of times they control your distribution, right? Which ultimately then controls your growth. Now that's okay, right? You just have to be cautious about it. Um, so what you have to think about is what is it going to take to displace their product, right? Like maybe initially to get some awareness, we build on Facebook or we build with this partner. Um, but then once we've done that, we've got to figure out how to kill that ecosystem and build our own, okay? So you've got to think about how do you transition into building your own platform. So it's not that it's a bad strategy, but if it's your only strategy, then it can be really limited. And too often, this is a strategy that people take. And if Facebook was, you know, first time, it's happening now with um, iPhone and Apple where people are complaining that they can't make money off of their apps because there's no discovery involved, right? So we see this time and time again that people build in these ecosystems and then just assume that the ecosystem is going to take care of them when the ecosystem has its own best set of interests, right? So at that point, you have to figure out how you are going to manage um, your growth. Okay. So um, we sort of did this as well at Mint, where initially what we did was we didn't have access to the thousands of banks where we could pull in users' data. Instead, there was a company called Yodely, and Yodely, over a 10-year period, had gone out and established all these relationships. And they actually went out and screened straight from all of the banks, all of the transactional data. So we just had to plug into their API and then retrieve all of that information. Well, the problem was, of course, that the, their data quality wasn't there, right? So ultimately, they were starting to limit our potential, right? Our users were arguing with us and complaining that the data quality just wasn't there, they weren't sure if it was accurate or not. So eventually we had to build our own in-house solutions that we could provide our you know, customers with accurate data. So you always have to think about how you can start off with a third-party solution, but then build it on your own. This is kind of the build versus buy mentality, where initially it's cheaper to just buy it from somebody who's already built it, but then eventually it will become a huge burden you know, to your business that you've got to start building it in-house. Okay. Um, I have a question. Is it like negative? Would it be like bad in some cases to, you know, what you're talking about, like buying something? Because it's obviously cheaper and like easier to get, but then like your company becomes known for having, you know, bad quality data or for like not being like high quality? Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, so, so that's the point, is once that starts to happen, once it really starts to affect your business, you've got to figure out how to improve that, right? And if your solution is like ours, where it's a third-party vendor, you've got to figure out how to get the data into your system yourself. But it's, it's probably okay to get started with it. I mean, it was, it was like, you know, 75%, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, in terms of helping us out. But this, the same thing happens even with, like, you know, physical products that you make, right? You might decide, hey, I'm not going to build the USB drive from scratch. I'm just going to, like, take some off-the-shelf component and use that. So um, when we talk about market research, right, the whole goal in doing this is because it's one of the key components 
that's going to help us get closer towards customer discovery. There's going to be many others. I'll cover them today, and then I'll cover them next week as well. Um, but don't use your market research as the assumption that this is, you know, the demographics of customers that we can go after, right? Because there could be new segments that are sprouting that don't necessarily get covered. So sometimes there is a little bit of magic behind this, um, and it's not always about you know, doing the research, but you need to do the research so that you understand at least where the competitors are headed and how they do customers. So what about in the case, you know, we've talked a lot about maybe building products that have already, you know, reinventions, right? So the product already exists and we refine it. Like we talked about the iPod and the iPhone, and we talked about you know, various motorcycles. So what if you're in, um, you know, create this new product and there's, you know, no market for it. It's brand new. It's a thing no longer. Right? What do you do? What did you do to position yourself? Yeah. Well, you have to create a market, sure. Show why other people need it. Okay. Advertise a lot. Or <laughs> get a lot of publicity. Yeah, well, I mean, you're all sort of right. So the thing is, when you build this middle, co this middle row here, when you build for a new market, the problem that happens is we don't even know who your customers are. I mean, yeah, we don't know who our customers are now even with like an existing product, but we have some idea of it because we can, you know, resegment an existing market or we can look at an existing market and figure out who is it being served, right? But with a new market, we just don't know who our customers are. We built something, we don't know who's gonna show up to buy it. The other is we can't even define the product category, right? Because it's it's so new. And at first you know, a lot of the features that we have are going to seem irrelevant. People are going to be like, well, why do I even need this thing? Why is this even important, right? Um, the, the best example I can come up with this for this is Ford, right? Where, um, he, you know, forceless carriage is how he had to market it before people actually got it. But up until then, they were like, this is a death trap. I'm not getting into this thing. Like, what do I need this? So I've got this, like, you know, sturdy little pony here, or horse. So you have to think about defining it in the context of something else. That's always going to be the case, but it's hard in a new market. The other thing um, is there is going to be a very, very long cycle of you having to get out there and evangelize. Not your early adopters, but actually you. So you have to do a lot of education on why this is an important product, how it's useful, you know, how it's going to benefit their lives. And a lot of that doesn't happen um, when you are doing a reinvention, when you're already in a market, and you can obviously benefit off of positioning. Does this make sense? So, what might some other market forces be that we have to consider, besides competition? What else might limit adoption? Um, like the economic environment, like the okay. recession, you know, sure. if you have a luxury product, people aren't going to buy it. Yep, okay. Well, that's... Okay. Maybe, like, regulatory stuff? Good, yeah. Okay, those are all right. Yep. So, there could be policies, and these policies could be non-governmental. And by policies, I mean, like, let's say you're a B2B company, right? Oh, we're a franchise. We can only buy from vendor X, because that's what our franchise, you know, agreement is. And so it's really hard to kind of break your product into that kind of relationship. Or, you know, like you mentioned, regulations. So government-based regulations. Um, they oftentimes obviously impose a very high barrier to entry, but the thing is, thing is, once you get over that barrier to entry, then you pretty much kind of have some level of protection, right? Other people have to go through, like, all the FDA regulations or, or whatnot in order to get their product adopted. The other is sometimes you need to have just permits and licenses for a new product. I was talking to some guys, some IT guys um, in Chapel Hill last week, and they, or earlier this week, and they said, you know, they haven't gotten their beer license yet, so um, they can only, like, give away their beer. They can't sell it. That, that's not an average thing. Well, that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. It's a networking event for a startup. Um, yeah, if you're all, if, if whoever's over 21 can come and ask me. Um, I think I went to one of these this summer. Yeah? yeah. It's called Exit Event? 
Yeah, it was it was it at uh, one of the underground places? It's in they, I think they have one there. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, was yeah. that Duke Chan? I don't think they had a license either. <laughs> they were just giving away. Yeah, they just have to take the full scene. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of different like <laughs> other yeah. coming yeah. Brewer, brewers <laughs> that are all apparently icy guys. Um, and apparently investors like that. Like, what are the investors like that? Hipsters. Yeah. Uh, and then the final, of course, you know, barrier could be infrastructure, right? The reason there's not more electric cars because there's not enough electric. Target stations everywhere. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, transitioning from all of the market research into customer discovery, right? So there's basically four steps that we're going to cover, um, possibly not all of them, but there are a number of them when we talk about how do we get our customers. And so the first is obviously discovery, and the way that we have to do that is by doing some market research, and then we'll be able to validate that we have these customers based on the early adopters, um, but then of course, you know, pricing, product distribution, all of these also factor in. We're not going to talk as much about customer creation because that's more mainstream. Okay. So, in the customer discovery phase, this is not the period where you go out to people and say, tell me what you want me to build, right? We're not a, a company that builds custom things, right? Remember, we're still building something that can eventually be mass market, have mass market appeal, or even if it's still a niche market, you know, still applies to a general number of people, not just one person. So this is not the stage to go and ask, you know, tell me what you want. It is certainly the stage to, you know, get at some pains and some problems that they're experiencing. It's also not the time to say, here's something that I built, right? Because we're assuming that we're not building anything yet. Um, and will you pay for whatever, you know, pay X dollars for it, right? And then the key, though, is that you've got to focus on their needs, which means that you've got to understand what are their pain points, what are they experiencing today, and can you possibly build a solution off of those pain points? So some of the goals are you've got to start by obviously validating who your user segments are by looking at the market research identifying the neglected segments. And then finally, you've got to verify demand, right? So you have some hypothesis of what some of their problems might be because you would have done your competitive analysis, you have seen that, oh, people really hate that the competitor does X, Y, and Z, so now we're going to go verify by talking to a bunch of early adopters that this is indeed the case. Okay. So we talked once again about early adopters. We talked about them a lot. Once again, we're just going to drive this point home. The key characteristics that you need to be looking for in early adopters, you know, number one is, do they actually have a budget? Or can they acquire a budget? Right? Because if not, then they're not really going to pay for anything and they're not truly an early adopter. And then, like I said, it's possible that they've already put together a solution based on some substitutes. So it doesn't always have to be the case, but the majority of the time, it is the case. And have they been actively looking for a solution? Because if they're not, then nothing you bring to them is going to be worth their time, right? And then, of course, this is kind of like a 12-step program. You know, are they aware of having a problem? And if they have a problem, you know, not just awareness, but they also you know, currently have the problem today. They don't know that it's going to be a problem. Now, there are some other customers that you might have. And why do you think I put these up? Sure. But who who would a decision maker be? The person who makes the final decision on buying or not buying. Well, that's kind of the economic buyer, right? The user. Okay. Or the person who's in trust. Would that be like... If you made pens, then a company decided that they were only going to use your pens in all their offices, and like there's one person who decided. Yeah, to sure. Work those pens. Sure, that's yeah, that's a good point. So <coughs> it's yeah. there's yeah, the kind of the end user and then the person that's like, oh, you know, I've got to own like sharpie markers or whatever. Yeah, so that's the decision maker. Then the economic buyer might be like, you know, the CFO who has to like write the check. Right. The reason I bring this up is because sometimes. Your, the person that you're sitting there talking to, the early adopter, might not be the one that you actually um, can sell to. There might be other folks who are influencing them. 
They might be recommenders, influencers, customers, right? This is, yep. Yeah, I was going to say, that, uh, like, for a family or something. Yeah. If, like, your parents are, like, when you're, if you're selling to a younger crowd, right. then your parents are the ones who are actually going to have the money to pay for it. Right. So or you, you ask your them. you ask your mom, and then she's like, well, let's wait until your dad comes home. Yeah. <laughs> you have to just make things like this decision, right? So, yeah. There's always some sort of committee or consensus that has to take place on this. So this is why coming back to you know the first couple lectures, I talked about getting out and making friends with experts and influencers. The reason you want to do this is because they affect purchasing decisions and eventually the adoption of your product. Right? This is why you know people try to get LeBron James to like wear their you know shoes or jerseys or whatever, right? Because they have product endorsements. So the one thing that you've got to do in your customer interviews at, for your lab is to get people to put a price on pain, right? And by that, it, I mean having conversations with them around what they typically experience. So let's just assume you know, you're trying to tell them some accounting software, right? And you ask them the question, well, you know, what do you use today to do your accounting? And they might say, oh, but, you know, James over here, he's my accountant. I'm like, okay, so how much do you pay James? And he's like, oh, you know, hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, okay, great. And you know, when's the last time maybe James made a mistake that cost you something, right? Because then you gotta try to get the pain. And he's like, oh, well, you know, last year we had to do an audit because James was like filing the taxes wrong and it cost me fifty thousand dollars. You're like, oh, that's interesting. So what if you know I could offer you a product where you would get audited ever again? How much would you pay for it? And then he's going to scratch his head and be like, oh, I don't know, like 10 bucks? Right? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> that does not compute, right? You just said that, you know, you wasted $50,000. What if I could save you that? Wouldn't, you know, wouldn't you at least pay me half that amount, right? Or something of that range? So these are the kinds of conversations that you want to get at. What's the pain? What might they have experienced with their substitute products? Right, some problems they might have experienced and why your product might be able to benefit them. Okay, I know it's a trite example, but hopefully it's the point across. So essentially, are you asking them how much you would pay to have a better product? <coughs> mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Oh, and the other, the other caveat to that is also, you know, you have to, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but just to highlight it right now, um, is also the cost of inaction, right? You don't buy this pill today for me, you know, you're going to get fat tomorrow. <laughs> right? Or you're going to die tomorrow, right? So there are certain things that you just have to do. Uh, so it's not just about, well, I can live with my substitute. It's like, no, 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 what if James, you know, in 2013, you have another <coughs> audit. What's that going to do, right? What's the cost of inaction? Sometimes people need to understand that as well. So that also fits into your, your marketing and your customer discovery. So, if you can get at people's level of need, that's going to be an indicator for whether or not they're going to adopt what it is that you're going to sell, right? And the way to gauge their level of need is we call a latent need, which is they have a problem, like I said, and they know they have a problem. And the difference between that and active is they are looking for a solution today. And the reason that oftentimes this comes up is because a lot of times people will just Acknowledge that they have a problem, but they're like, you know, hang up the phone, I'm not looking for anything. Like, I hate my internet service provider, but, well, only, you know, unnamed, but I'm not going to switch. Because the cost of switching is just too annoying, right? So they have to actively be searching for a solution in order for them to really be an early adopter. And then the final is that, you know, they might have a, a, a vision of a solution. They might kind of understand what it is that they want, and they might have cobbled it together themselves. Um, but, you know, uh, as Hannah mentioned, they better be prepared for a better one. It's not just enough what they've got today. You know, you've got the new fangled thing, which is going to make them ten times better. So, the other thing we have to think about is not just the level of need, right, but also if you think some of those Competitor, uh, customers and competitors are people that you can persuade, then what's their level of loyalty, right? 
are they going to be able to you know, just continue using an existing solution or can you convert them? Sometimes you can't. And the reason sometimes you can't if there's a high level of loyalty is um, you'll, you'll hear them say things like, oh, you know, I really need to see feature like X, Y, and Z first before I'm really going to get interested. So until you build that, like, don't come talk to me. And that list is just going to keep growing because it's just an excuse. Or they're going to be like, well, you know, you're just a young company. You just, you just graduated from Duke. I don't know. Or Tusty, right? So they give you a level of credibility that they need to wait for. And then finally, you know, it's not kind of good. Then they're going to be a little bit risk averse. They're like, oh, I don't know, you're once again a young company, and like, what if you run away with my data, or you collapse, or you know, what happens then, you know, to me? What if there's a recall on the product, right? There are all these things that people are so concerned about. And as a result, they take a really, really long time to make a decision. Once again, it's not early adopting material, right? So if you see any of these signs, you sort of say thank you for your time, and then you move on. And you sort of have to do that. You can't be like, oh, they said we were really great. Yeah, but you're not going to buy your product, right? <laughs> Until they hand over a dollar or more, they're not going to buy your product. So the key is, you know, once again, testing across a number of user segments. Because you're not necessarily sure which of the folks, <coughs> even if you come up with a theory of who these segments are, which of the ones are going to demonstrate a need versus demonstrate a high level of loyalty. And until you have those conversations, you won't get a sense. So, just to recap, right, we talked about more on positioning, right, what's the thing we said about positioning? What, what can't we do anymore when we talk about positioning? Positioning isn't just about price. Price, exactly, right? And the other thing is that people could also have a product line, right, that spans across all the price points, in which case, what do you have to do? Create a new lifestyle choice market. Yep, exactly. And then we talked a little bit about horizontal versus vertical, right? So what's the difference between being in a horizontal or providing a solution for a horizontal market versus a vertical market? Horizontal is like across uh, different, it's, a, it's one solution that can be adopted in different places. And vertical is more niche specific. Okay. And then, what's the issue that we have when we have substitutes? <laughs> they might be too addicted to them. Sure. Um, and it'll be hard to shift them off. So the, yeah, the main problem is shifting them off those uh, substitutes towards your own product. Right. Okay. And then we talked a little bit about secondary markets. So what's the problem when we have secondary markets, when our competitor owns the secondary market? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're able to sell at a cheaper price and it's hard for you to like, get them. Yeah, there's a, no other, like, it. yeah, they control, like, all the distribution, right? Okay, and then when we talked about a point tool versus an integrated solution, what's, what is your strategy here? Okay. Um, you can <coughs> maybe, as you're starting off, integrate in order to gain some traction, but you don't want to, like, be on that horse for too long because it could be problematic because your success is dependent on that. Sure, but what specifically about your success? Um, the adoption. Okay, yep, distribution, yeah. <coughs> okay, great. Well, that's all I've got for today. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Sure.